Hello, this is Ipo Swords, and today is day four of a week of small swords. Today we're going to be revisiting Kalishamad, which we discussed on day two. However, this video is going to have a slight twist to it. For any regular visitors to my social media, particularly Reddit and Imager, you will recognize a sword that is about to come into frame. From what you can see here, this is a completely regular Kalishamad small sword characterized by the extremely broad blade at the base, and, in the case of this actual antique, a hologram triangular cross-section. The hilt is of cut steel, and the blade is of the typical form. Having said that, let me adjust your perspective on the matter just a little bit. This blade is not a Kalish mod in the traditional sense as it does not narrow after the fort, but stays broad its entire length. In fact, here at the base of the blade, it is over an inch in width, and even here, close to the tip, only lost half an inch, being about an inch wide. The tip is also not broken off or tampered with, it is intentionally made this way. If you see here, the fuller continues to here where it neatly terminates, leaving this area completely untampered with, as can be evidenced by the fact that it has not been reground to form a new tip. This rather spatulate yet still pointed tip is the original shape for this sword. As you can see, there is a fuller running the entire length of this sword. Normally on Kalishamards, you would see that the swelled section does not have a fuller at all, and only the thrusting section does. However, in this case, the entire blade is lightened. The edge is extremely fine, with a very steep angle to the spine. As you can see, the spine has a very acute ridge. The hilt is made of cut steel and features many lightened components. As you can see here, the pommel itself is hollow, and is permanently affixed to this knuckle bow, which attaches to this cover on the ricasso, which is also hollow. The fingerings, while large enough to use, are not necessarily made to be used. They lack the very traditional circular shape that you see on fingerings on small swords. The guard is very exquisitely wrought from steel or iron. It features a spiral motif that is rather in the form of fern leaves, a very popular styling at the time. Each side of this bilobate guard is symmetrical to the other side, featuring three ferns and vine work on the outside. This hilt is one of the earlier examples I have seen, featuring a cut steel handle, made in the very distinctive faceted style. The hilt is blued and is attached via ferrules to the pommel and the connected ricasso covering, which is very wide. If you've watched Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria's video on the matter, he notes that these sorts of reinforced steel connections on the ricasso are indicative of military small swords, and that brings us into a topic of philosophy of use. In order to examine philosophy of use, we have to look at the only other extant example of a blade of this type on a small sword, and that requires us to go to the Mount Vernon collection, which contains the 1753 silver hilted small sword owned by what was at the time Major and then General Washington. When Washington was serving in the army, he was using a sword with a Gudrun silver hilt, and a blade in a very similar format to this, which you can currently see on your screen. His blade, however, tapers slightly more sharply than our example. The benefits of this blade shape are clear in two particular contexts. If you are to use it as a military sword, the extra width and cutting capacity confer significant benefits when in the bind against other swords and when thrust into the flesh of an opponent. This blade is extremely stiff, being the stiffest sword I own, stiffer than even my sharp cutting swords made for modern practice. I cannot bend this even three centimeters offline when 
applying significant pressure. However, I will not do that as this is a very old and very rare antique. As mentioned, the other excellent example was owned by General Washington in his time in the French and Indian War. There were in fact several battles which he would have been wearing it. The Mount Vernon website notes that the blade is likely older than the hilt in that circumstance, and it was rehilted perhaps from one of his relatives. And that concurs with my tentative dating of this, coming from the first half of the 18th century. In the first half of the 18th century, Dueling was, of course, outlawed, as it had been for quite a while, and this applied to all of Europe, including the British Isles. And that brings us to our other possible philosophy of use. This sword's design is very conducive to dueling. The steel sharp blade, with its very fine edges, is able to do push and draw cuts very effectively. I have in fact cut myself on this blade whilst cleaning it once before. This is very unusual for a small sword. The ability to cut is something that was decidedly removed in all of them. From your typical Kalishamad, which taper down to a thin blade, to your typical triangular cross-section blades, which have no cutting ability whatsoever. In a first blood duel, this extremely stiff blade has a physical and mechanical advantage in the bind against other swords. It also has the advantage of being able to draw blood on something other than a thrust. It's also a very light sword. This sword comes in at 415 grams, and that's due to the lightening performed on the hilt. There were, however, later blades in a very similar style to this. These were called Preval blades, after General Claude Antoine Hippolyte de Preval, who in 1831 instated a sword with a basket-like hilt and blades similar to these which did taper slightly more aggressively and were rather long. This is over a century later than the styling of this hilt, and it's incredibly unlikely that this blade is rehilted, considering the reworking that would have to be done in order to make it light enough to be suitable in a small sword package, as these Preval blades were significantly heavier than what you see here. They're also not widely adopted. Many of the benefits of this sword, being stiff and light, can be conferred into those, However, having a pronounced ridge like this of course limits your cutting capacity. In a battle scenario, this is of course a problem, as we do devolve into our natural instincts, which is to hack and slash. However, in a duel, when you are very trying very hard not to have yourself cut, this is an ideal weapon. We can only speculate as to who have made or owned this. However, I would venture to say it is probably British in manufacture being one of the places where cut steel was popular, where the fern leaf motif was popular, and where similar hilts have been found. One should be on your screen, right now. This sword probably hasn't seen very much use. There are three very fine nicks on the blade, each less than half a millimeter in any dimension. These are likely from contact with another blade, as they are not the sort of damage you see from storage or from cleaning and it's obvious that they are not particularly deep. This likely happened during a very quick, short exchange. If we return to the design of this blade, the full-length fuller, going all the way down, provides this blade with exceptional lightness. It balances approximately three inches from the guard, in the same pace as you'd expect other small swords, and weighs a total of 415 grams. This is even on the light side for small swords, however this is a full length sword, being just within the range that you'd expect a small sword, having a blade length a little over 70 centimeters, a mite shorter than the average 80 centimeters, but well within historical ranges. The elaborate guard may have served to offset the very specialized nature of this sword. If you saw someone wearing this, in a scabbard, you may have assumed it was simply the uh, previously discussed Epée du Soldat, a modern term describing a wide-bladed small sword that was used by soldiers from the 1680s onwards in France. They share very similar features, having rather robust hilts, finger rings on most of them, and broader blades than your average small sword. The extremely specialized form you see here can be used for one of the two aforementioned reasons, 
either for battle as an officer or for dueling. And another bit of evidence towards the dueling hypothesis is that when held in a right-handed grip, the flat faces up. This is something you only see on dueling swords due to the way they were meant to flex in practice with their paired sharps. The sharp pointed version of a dueling sword will also have the flat facing upwards. I'll attach an article which talks about some rare examples which are made like more modern court swords, which have the spine facing upwards. However, this was very much not the norm, especially in the 18th century. This example thus has many specializations to make it more effective. It is extremely stiff, extremely light, has very fine edges, and while it cannot cut deeply due to the spine, is able to perform push and draw cuts. The hilt is very elaborate and extremely lightened. This helps with the balance of the sword, leaving it in the typical position, regardless of the fact the blade is highly modified. The hilt offsets the extremely utilitarian nature of the blade, and may have served as a disguise for this sword, keeping it from drawing too much attention. However, once the sword was unsheathed, it would be clear that whoever owned it possessed both the temperament and perhaps the inclination to duel, regardless of the legality, or rather illegality, of this activity at the time. I have spoken to museum curators via email, asking if they've seen any other swords of this type, and barring the Preval swords and General Washingtons, I cannot find other historical examples of this type. However, it is somewhat common to see its cousin in the standard Kalishamart, like this Castile Armory example. The differences are rather clear. The narrowing of the blade past the fort means that while they are almost equally as stiff, although not quite as stiff as this, having more material to it, in a very different configuration, they lack all cutting capacity. This has some, although it is, of course, limited. Another distinctive difference you'll see on Kalisha Mards is that, in most cases, the edges will not be so thin. This spine is extremely acutely shaped. This makes the blade very light, whereas Kalisha Mards, on average, are heavier than your standard small swords. So, we have now looked at what may have been the cousin to a sword made in Britain for General Washington. It exhibits many of the same features, with a unique blade that cannot be found on any other swords. It's also worth noting that there is no point to make a blade like this for any other sword. If you are making a full broadsword, it is not sensible to use a blade which limits your cutting capacity. This is rather like a side sword modernized to 18th century standards. The side sword, of course, would have had a regular cross guard rather than the clamshell you see here, or it would have had swept rings. However, in other ways, it was quite similar, with the finger rings, knuckle bow, and pommel in the typical arrangement you'd see here. In fact, tomorrow, we're going to look at a hilt that very much resembles an earlier side sword hilt. But that, of course, is a topic for another day. Until then, this has been Ipo Sword, talking about one of the rarest swords in my collection. This has been day four of my week of small sword videos. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video, subscribing to my channel, and leaving a comment with any questions in the description, as I'm sure you'll have some with this very unique blade. That's all for today. Until next time, stay sharp.